the only other guy that that in, that I heard of that put that kind of fear most recently was Ron Artest. I heard stories that, that folks with with Ron, you know, when they were getting ready to face him, would go, "Ah, you know what? I, I you know, I don't think I'm gonna sit this one really? out or whatever." I, know, I never heard that. I know. Yeah. I know back in the days we got the lead, they used to always say, we're going to send a limbo to pick you up. So when they used to say, we're going to send a limbo to pick you up, that mean that, that guy trying to get 40 points, he trying to make sure you come to the game. <laughs> <laughs> Mentioned the great things that you're doing in the community. Tell me about the Charles Oakley Foundation. Yes, yeah, the foundation is something I've really got involved with. I've been doing stuff about this side like a year ago to get involved in the foundation. So All Star Weekend was my first event for the Oakley Foundation. And we was trying to go, like I said, get out in the community, go back, do stuff with kids, show people that, you know, what the foundation is about. It's a lot of love. Um, you know, trying to, like I said, I was trying to give them something, have hopes about, like, never forget this All Star Weekend in Cleveland. Like I said, a T-shirt and a bag, keychains. Uh, some stuff that they can take home and put on the wall and look at it as a motivation. But we, you know, try to go around um, a couple of centers and serve great meals, hot meals, and uh, go to, the, I went to a high school game and just walk in, not with 20, 30 people walking in by myself, sit there and watch the game, uh, the pet rally. It, it was a great weekend. I think we got some really good, um, a lot of good uh, contents out of this going forward. And now we work on our scholarship program, then we work on other programs that, you know, after school with kids. Yeah, how did the idea come about uh, to put together your book, The Last Enforcer? Okay, The Last Enforcer. It's just a book that I've been working on for a while. And I was, I tried to get the deal like 10 years ago. It didn't go through. So two years ago, me and Frank talked, I said, we got to get this book. So we got the deal. Um, the book is just a book, just like for my grandfather, growing up in Cleveland, going to, to live with my uh, grandfather, my grandmother, and my aunts and uncles in Alabama for a while, coming back to Cleveland with mom. Mom had to, you know, work two jobs, one job, she had to catch two buses every day for so many years, but she got it done, raising six kids. But it, the book is just a lot, a lot about the family, NBA, uh, stories, and just my growth as, you know, as, as the book goes, the stronger I get. You know, sort of my grandfather. And all my strengths come from this book and show you uh, get my toughness from just growing up. You had to be tough, mentally tough in Cleveland growing up because a lot of things was going on. But it's just like doing podcasts over the year on the, on the back page of the post or whatever. So everybody can see like the inside of me. They might see my face, but they don't know what's inside of me. Now they can get the whole thing out of this book. Oh, uh, what was it like working with uh, our guy on the uh, Yes Network, Frank Guy Stola, for this book? So Frank, okay. a great guy. Frank was working with the beat um, for the Daily News. So the last few years in New York, but I got to know Frank. But uh, I think that uh, when you're a beat writer, you come in to interview guys, you need a, you need some kind of spark in a story. So he know he could always come to me. All the writers, I, I was good with the writers all around, not, not just New York, because I think they, they have a job to do, I have a job to do. So even though we win, lose, or draw, you still have to talk to them. And that's how I go. And these guys, like now, I see a lot of these writers and stuff. Now I got a book come out. How are we gonna write something about it? Because you gotta be real with people. You know, we all down sometimes when we lose, but they have a job to do. The job ain't over until you leave the arena. So you have to give them your time, 10, 15 minutes. And I was good. I was good at that. I didn't I didn't blame the writers. I blame the team when we lost. Real quick, just for young reporters out there, a lot of players don't like reporters. What, what did you like about Frank Isola? What would you tell young reporters who are interviewing players? Because there's not a lot of great relationships out there between athletes and the NFL. No, it's, it's a lot of bad. It's about a lot of bad. I mean, with reporters and players now, I see a, I see a lot of players are not doing report. After, I blame management because they it's in their contract. Start finding guys instead of ten thousand, two or three hundred thousand. They should shouldn't even have to come to that. But now writers. Uh, they have a job to do. Uh, I mean, if they go too overboard, you have the player, you have a right to set something to them. But most players going to try to, uh, most writers going to try to work their way in. they be good because they know that they got to be with you for 82 games and plus the playoff or uh, preseason. So some some every now and then go out their way and try to sl slide something in the story. And then you read the story like I didn't say that. And that's the issue. But I give 90% of them, they good guys. 
uh, it's always going to be a bad apple in the bunch. So that's life. I, I loved it. I finished the book. It was terrific. <laughs> Again, I'm very nostalgic of that time, you know, in the 90s and the physical play and, the, you know, I mean, you have to be mentally tough today, but, you know, different type of mental toughness, um, talking about that time and the battles that you had on the court with the Pistons teams, the book, and real quick out the Pistons. Yeah. I think it's fair. Yeah, I had, um, uh, I was doing some work in the in the WNBA not long ago, and Bill Lambert, when he was coaching the oh, Detroit yeah. he was still taking shots at Larry Bird. Like, all this time in the past, like, that blood, bad blood with the Pistons, whether it's from Larry's side, the Bulls' side, the Knicks' side, it's still there about those Detroit guys. <laughs> Uh, yes, in this book we talk about all of the '80s and '90s, all the matches with the, with the, you know, with the Bulls, Boston, Indiana, and the Knicks. But I mean, yeah, Detroit was there, but I think Detroit went over edge a lot. They they played, you know, a little, you know, like they did stuff on, you know, they tried to do stuff. I, my thing, you could be big, bad, and tough, but my thing, I never tried to hurt another player. A certain way you can see things happen on the court that they try to hurt guys, but. I mean, you know, it was physical back then, but a lot of them guys wasn't really physical. It was just part of the game, you know. So if you catch one of them guys outside, they're a different type of guy. You know, they don't want no problems. So it was it's almost like acting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. What were some of your favorite rivalries during your 18 and a half, 18 and a half year playing career? I, I look at it totally different. I look at it as a, just a game. I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's the Knicks and the Bulls, the Knicks in uh, Indiana. I mean, yeah, we all went down to the wild, tough game. We played physical. Uh, I just like the challenge. Uh, it wasn't like I was, I think everybody was tough every given night to me because I had to do all the dirty work and I, you know, I didn't get to do the pretty thing on offense, take a lot of shots. So I didn't play defense, rebound, take the charges. So, I didn't look at it as one special team, but I looked at everybody I had to play hard and tough against because you go out against a weaker team, it's like, oh, this is a night off, and then you lose and you be all upset at yourself. So I looked at every, I took the same approach for every game. You, you, in the book, you know, you talked about challenging a lot of guys who may have, you know, crossed the line with you on the court and you set them straight real quick and then that was that. <laughs> it was over. Um, who are some guys that, that earned your respect for their toughness? Uh, I didn't look at them like that. They, are, they ain't, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't a dollar sale with me. Uh, it just say just come and play because I'm coming to play. I'm coming to play hard every night. So what happened happened. <laughs> what was your favorite game of your? Do you, have, do you have a favorite game from your playing career? Either a, a a great win or a performance that you had. What's one that you reflect on that's your, that's your favorite? Well, it's got to be uh, in the Pacers in 93, 94, going to the finals. You know, to win that game and get to the finals, I mean, that's what will come first, what we, you know, advance or chance to win. I don't look into career stats. I could have had 30, 30, or 35. That don't mean nothing. I looked into the game and got us to the finals, and that's the most important game because we would never won that game. We would never made it to the finals. So all we, we had a chance to win a championship, and that's the most important thing. On on the flip side, what's the toughest loss of your career? The toughest loss, probably uh, the in the in the well, the toughest loss probably Game Seven. Um, I mean, it's still you know I'm trying to win, so that game stops us from winning. Anything has my life. My story is about a point in life that you get a chance to win a championship, and that in that game against uh, uh, Houston in Game Seven. And then the game in Indiana to get us to the, the finals. So there was two important games. And I think that, uh, matter of fact, I was talking to Boomer yesterday about the Cincinnati Bingo. And I went back in time with him. I guess a lot of people, he probably never knew I knew this. The drive that the Rams had on Cincinnati was the same drive that the Portland had on Cincinnati back in the, I think, 80s, last 97, last time they went. 87 or 97, I don't know which one. Whatever it was, it was a, a two times since that lost the two Super Bowls, both of them was on the last drive. Wow. Wow. What is the um fans are a part of this too when you're out right. and about give me a game that re fans remind you of the most. Is there one that fans remind you of the most? Um uh, not really. The fans, I mean, I talk to a lot of fans. They come with me. We love how you play, we like how you play. We, we just like it because your mindset. 
and you know they really don't you know they just come with me that they just be real with me and just you know they don't get into the numbers they just said they and they like hey you showed up every night and you put it all on the line so i respect them always for knowledge me but i respect them but just don't understand the basketball it ain't about the guy who scored 20 points 25 points every night uh, you come from an HBCU, very proud in that respect, and drafted and then traded to Chicago. Um, when did you, what was the first moment you realized that you really clicked with Michael Jordan? Uh, so in his book, you know, you know, Michael Jordan did the forward. So um, it, it could have been that time we was in Seattle and we, we was in Seattle, we had that dinner. And um, something happened, you know, he had made the all-star team. So this is second year of my first year. And something happened at the table that everybody ordered their food. At the end, the check came, right? And the guys were telling, you know, everybody was like, okay, this is my mic. So the guy was like, why are we um, trying to put this bill together? Let's make Michael pick. He made the, he was uh, he was an all-star last year. And he, is, and he just went all like y'all get paid the same way I get paid good in y'all part so one thing led to another so they almost got in a fight and I broke the fight up and uh it just seemed like we clicked like I'm like no nah, it's okay you know we grown man let's take care of our own bed but that and maybe taking me to the rookie all-star team we just we just clicked it for some reason you know I guess my work happened and I didn't take no mess I always, personally, I always um, think it's amazing when two people stay, for, who aren't blood, you know, stay close and remain friends right. over a period of time. You know, there's yeah. so many things in life that you can have a falling out, you never talk again, whatever it may be. Um, how special is it to you that you have friendships like the one with Jordan where you guys are remaining close? I mean, it's great because I think we all get old, our lives change. And in this book, you know, he got married, I got married, and I think that he had a raise his family, I had to raise my family. But the most part, we still he still asked my call. Like, I know he was coming to Cleveland Sunday, and I was talking to him, and he was, you know, he left Daytona for the race and flying to Cleveland. When he got to Cleveland, I talked to him about that. But, you know, communication is there. I mean, we don't go, if he call me, I call him. And then he'll call me back up in the day, if not, not the same day, the next day, and like, what's going on, this and that. So I'm still on speed dial. He on my speed dial. And, you know, so it's still love there. Always going to be love there. I'm going to ask you about a couple of uh, guys in the book who come up uh, a bit. Um, uh, first, you know, you were traded from Chicago then to, to New York. Um, what was it? What, what was your issue over your time with uh, Patrick Ewing? As, as a as a as a player performer and leading the Knicks. So in the book, I talk about, about Patrick, right? Patrick, you and I, huh? I mean, my thing, my my guy traded in New York. I talk about it. I'm thinking I'm going to New York to play with Patrick. You know, I mean, you know, we came out the same year. He was the number one pick. I was the ninth pick in the draft. But I just found out he was a different guy. He went, to, you know, I'm leaving Chicago. I know what Mike is. You know, I didn't really know Patrick like that. I know I've been around her, his name and seen him play on TV, but he wasn't what I thought he was. And uh, that's just like, okay, let me, you know, continue with doing what I'm doing and try to make this train, you know, make sure it's a smooth ride all the way through with, you know, playing with him. So I, I got to deal with it. But it just, it was just a hard, it was a hard task because it was like, you know, leaving the White House, going to the next house. And, uh, you know, he, he's a he was a different guy. He, you know, he wasn't like a Mike, but, you know, I guess, you know, you got to adjust to whoever you're around. But I think adjusting to who you're around, but the player, you're supposed to be your marquee player, got to make sure everybody's okay. That wasn't the case. So it was a lot of learning point with, with Patrick. It was less learning with Mike. The Mike had it. Patrick was trying to get – Mike had the it fact, but Patrick didn't. So that was a big difference in basketball because – Mike could carry a team, and Patrick couldn't carry a team. The altercation with Dolan, folks folks know about it. What's your relationship with the Knicks right now? My relationship with the fans is great. Uh, my relationship with MSG is still the same. We're still in court. We got some things coming up in the next two months. I mean, 
it's just bad what's going on because someone created something and don't want don't want, to be, don't want to be held accountable for it. He made whatever happened that night. He he was the reason behind it, but because he don't like me. But he goes don't like me. He could have started a riot or anything in the garden because of one person. He didn't care about who else was there. That's the disrespect this guy is. He shouldn't even have an NBA team. He's not, he's not fit for a team because all the time you hear about him when he's doing something wrong, you hear about the team. The team has struggled for 20 years, and they said it all started up to the, at the top, and he run the show. Look what's going on this year. God don't like ugly. Your, your start to the book, you mentioned the foreword by Michael Jordan, but the start and mentioning Charles Barkley and setting the record straight um, is one of the more hilarious intros I've read in a while. Um, do, you, do you and Charles get along now? <laughs> Not really. Uh, <laughs> he said he don't know why I talk about him. I think he's full of S. So he, um, he, he talked a lot now. He didn't talk a lot when he played. And, you know, he just, you know, I guess... I guess working with TNT, you got to be an actor, got to be a clown and a commentator. So all three of them is him. So I don't know. But I think if you want to be a commentator about basketball, you want to talk about basketball, not about doing flicks and skits and stuff. I mean, I just never, I never seen a, a talk show like that before. But they win an award. So I guess acting is part of the job these days. Does anybody in, in today's game? remind you of yourself. It's a completely different game than the one that we saw, but do you see anyone that, that has uh, similarities that, that you appreciate? Um, I get a lot of Draymond Green. Draymond is a good guy, play hard. He do a lot undersized. He can play three or four position. I just like his heart, you know, that's the type of heart I had. No matter as long as, you know, my team win and that's what, he don't try to come out and get 20 points. Um, he give a lot of effort. He's the leader of the team. I'm the leader of New York, so I'm a good Draymond. You know, I like Draymond because he's a fighter on the court and off the court. He don't let people talk about how he play, all you know, this and that. But he get the job done and he got championships. So hey, it's great to be compared to Draymond. And uh, we, I'm just bigger, you know, and Draymond would have played in our era. It might have been different. But right now what I see, he getting the job done. Uh, Charles Oakley, Ben, I really appreciate your time. Really, really quick on, um, you mentioned LeBron and Stephen's book and these young guys in today's game who are still, still doing it. Um, you know, LeBron for a long time with that, with that Cleveland, Ohio connection. Um, Steph, you, you mentioned watching him as a little kid in, in Toronto. You know, how amazing has it been watching those guys, um, not only live up to expectations, but exceed expectations. Well, I think LeBron came out with it. Steph had to earn it. It's a big difference. But um, but Steph had the dad to teach him how to shoot. One of his dad, Dale, was one of the best shooters in the game. But Steph worked on his craft, even though he was young, playing one-on-one -on -one events in Toronto. But you can see he is more work. He seemed like he's working more every year because his game is all about feeling, moving. And LeBron is 18 years strong and still doing his thing. So you got to take the head off to one, both of them guys, because like I said, both of them on the West Coast now, and Steph, in the All-Star game, he's still what he doing. He shot, hit 50 points, 16 out of some, 16 threes out of, I don't know how many he took, but he made 16. But in, on the flip side of that, that can be bad habit for the younger kids, because they want to shoot threes, but they can't make a jump shot or layup, you know? So it's good for television, good for race, good for advertising, but it ain't good for the young generation. Work on your craft. You got to work on your craft to get one step at. So you work on your craft, you can be stealth. If you start shooting through his first, you can't be stealth. So what was it? What was it uh, like with Sean Marks and and um, he called you his his vet? What did you see as your role as a vet with young players like Sean? No, just you know making sure they're okay at all time. And you know, as a young guy, they tend to pick on you more as a coach, this and that. And you got to stay at the practice and work with the other guys. Sometimes the veterans don't always practice. But no, Sean was smart, understand, knew his craft. I, and I think that that's the harder part. A lot of guys coming in the league don't know the craft of how they can fit in. He knew he, could, he, was, a, he was a runner. He can uh, jump. He was a great athlete. And even though he was a good athlete, uh, he was just smart. He understood the game. So most of you and Pam, they, they have the smarts. So they pick up quick. Sean picked up quick. And, uh, he wouldn't have to sit, I didn't have to say too much to him. And let's go to lunch. Let's go to dinner sometime. The last enforcer, Charles Oakley. Um, 
I got to get a signed copy, Charles. Is there, you're gonna have a, a sign anywhere yeah. soon? We need to get a signed copy. I'm I'm finna start by late March in New York. I'm at four or five signings a day, so I'm gonna be in the city for like every other week in March. I love it. I love it. Folks, look forward to that. And please check out the book. Charles, thank you so much for your time. Greatly appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.